Hello, everybody. How are you all doing today? Uh, my name is Sammy. I'm the CEO of Certicraft. We have a lovely guest in Av Singh here today, who I'll introduce uh, later on today. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to do a land acknowledgement. Uh, I get to live, work, and play in Nelson, BC, and uh, in uh, this land where I am here, um, it's the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Sinaiqs people, and through intermarriage, the Tanaha people, and uh, it's a bit of a fucked up history. There is a scalping program and uh, uh, quite a few different things that led to a population of thousands of people amongst the Sinaiqs dwindling to a, a mere handful, like literally less than 10. Uh, and that's pretty screwed up. And so I encourage everybody to kind of just reflect on, you know, the realities of where they're from, uh, what the indigenous uh, histories are in the in the territories that you live in, what what happened there. Uh, I think uh, the first step to reconciliation is really just understanding what people um, who were here before us uh, have gone through. Um, and uh, with uh, that being shared, um, uh, I'm going to move on to the actual State of Craft stuff. So the State of Craft is a series, a podcast series, where we have lovely guests that are well-respected, that we really respect at Certa Craft, that we bring on board to discuss the state of the legal craft cannabis industry. What's going well, what's not going well, and what needs to change to create a actual vibrant industry where craft cannabis producers can thrive. Um, uh, like I said, I'm the CEO of Certicraft, and we at Certicraft are on a mission to help craft cannabis producers transition in and thrive within the regulated market. Uh, and we do that today primarily through a compliance platform that makes the ridiculously tedious compliance requirements here in Canada really easy. Um, if you're interested in chatting about that, please hit us up. We'd love to uh, help you out on your journey. Um, a few housekeeping items before I introduce Av. Uh, we have a chat. I see some of you have discovered it already and are saying hi. Oh, hi. Bonjour, Luke. I don't know who you are, but thanks for saying hi. <laughs> and uh, if you want to say hi, please go say hi there. We love having interactions. And uh, uh, we have a dedicated questions tab. So if you have questions for Av, please go ask them there. Uh, we will... Uh, um, if, if you'd like another question, you can upvote them. And at the end of the session, what we do is we just go in order of questions uh, in terms of how um, whatever's been most upvoted. And uh, yeah, um, without further ado, I would like to introduce to you the one and only Av Singh. Hello, Av. <laughs> Hey, Sammy. Uh, thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure. You've uh, been one of our favorite people in this industry for a very long time. And I actually, I actually have a moment that I remember. I was at a, um, I was at a garden store here, and I, I got uh, some guy a green because I, I wanted some, some nice healthy um, amendments to add to uh, my vegetable garden. And then, like, I had this moment. Where I was like, wait, didn't I have to say that he was? And then I looked you up online. And I was like, oh, my God, you started this company. I've been like using your stuff for years. And I had no idea. I'd never made the connection. <laughs> I, I didn't actually start the company. I've been I was recommending Gaia Green uh, for with a lot of organic growers about 30 years ago. And so it's 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 been a long relationship. And unfortunately, they've uh, they've been purchased by Hydro Farm Canada. And it's, you know, slightly slightly different way of, of, of doing business. So. OK, OK. Yeah. Politically correct answer. <laughs> so, Av, uh, can you tell us about yourself and uh, and what, what, who you are and what brings you here today? Well, you know what what brings me here today is the kind folks at uh, at Certicraft, and so it's really nice to to be here. I'm very uh, very excited. It's always it's, you know just I think Sammy the the way you just carry yourself it just you know always brings a, a smile to to everyone's face, and you know you, you start <laughs> using muscles in your face that you've never used before. Uh, thank so you. That's great. Um, and um, yeah, I, I'm I'm uh, I really appreciate your land acknowledgement, and uh, unfortunately, uh, we have very similar uh, practices uh, here in in Mi'kmaq territory, um, where where I, I believe uh, the scalping stuff is still in legislation. If 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 not, it was just recently removed. Mm -hmm. um, so so yeah, there's a there's a pretty uh, fucked up history here. But, you know, uh, it shows the resiliency and robustness of, of the Mi'kmaq people um, and, and those of the uh, Abenaki uh, or the Wabanaki uh, uh, Confederacy here. So, um, and yeah, I just uh, have been involved in the cannabis industry for, for probably uh, almost uh, 10 years. 
And um, it's, it is definitely becoming more uh, state of the art in, 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 in many ways. So happy to be a, um, as I think we were talking previously that there's kind of this, hopefully a Phoenix rising from the ashes of, of maybe what legalization brought to, to cannabis. I certainly hope so. It'd be nice to um, have the governments just recognize, oh, okay, so up until now, it's really been like lobbyists driven by people who have zero background in cannabis. There's a lot of people struggling who are the political activists that fought to legalize this plant. Um, maybe we should actually work with the people who care about the plant. I don't, I don't have much faith in some levels of government, like Health Canada comes to mind as an organization that I really don't have much faith in. They seem to be really in bed with corporate lobbyists all across the board, not just in cannabis, talking with people in the natural uh, tinctures and apothecary, I don't know what you'd call it, sector, or people in the meat industry. It looks like Health Canada's done the same kind of thing in lots of different industries where all the little people have been really like screwed over in favor of giant corporations. And that was kind of really sad to learn that like, this is just a thing that health Canada does. Um, really sad about the state of our government, I'd say in society if that, that, that you have an organization centered around health that really seems to be centered around corporate interests instead. Uh, and, and, and mind you, I should make it clear I have very limited perspective, so maybe they do a lot of other things that is actually that is actually great. So I don't want to be like shitting on Health Canada here, but uh, from my conversations with people in other industries who've really struggled, it, I don't have a very good perspective right now. Uh, but outside of Health Canada, I have lots of uh, hope um, with lots of different, uh, uh, both provincial and federal organizations that seem to really be caring about uh, doing a better job. The CRA, I've had lots of great conversations with them where they are legitimately really open to change. Uh, the BC government, uh, for the most part outside of maybe the bcldb um have uh, been really really positive and, and hopeful what's what's it like on the east coast actually i'm i'm super i'm really connected to like the local provincial uh federal governments and i hear a bit about alberta because they're our neighbors and we have lots of customers in alberta but i don't really know much about what's happening in your neck of the woods could you share um you know it, it's and, and and i i agree with the, all of your comments i think they're they're very appropriate um, unfortunately we do have to work with health canada and and we really do need to continue to try to shape them but the canadian government in general is is always been tied into corporate interests and that's what i think really when we start seeing a lot of these you know dramatic food price increases and whatnot it's it's a strictly a reflection of um the way we've been running business and in fact favoring export and import over just you know local production which has been the model that i think we uh kind of put down onto cannabis as well and 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 uh, in many ways uh, great disservice to our citizens as well as to the plant um when we look at atlanta canada it's conservative by nature um but it's really interesting to see how the the four provinces in the Atlantic provinces are are treating cannabis um, uh, quite differently. We we would look to New Brunswick as as probably the most uh, progressive uh, approach in terms of their retail. They they've um, uh, privatized some retail uh, companies. It's still predominantly run through um, Cannabis New Brunswick, but at the same time, they have allowed for Farmgate. And, and so that's, uh, I, I know something that hopefully will happen in late fall in, in British Columbia. Um, we'll see what that really brings to, to, to cannabis in, in BC as well. And what's, um, what's the, what's the new Brunswick distribution board? What are they like in terms of their gatekeeping, so to speak of product moving through? Do they actually like listen to the industry and get good quality stuff through or is it like bc where it's like is it above 25 percent thc yes or no <laughs> yeah and and it's, it's uh, I, th I think unfortunately um yeah as as a as a, a nation we're, we're stuck there right okay. um cannabis in brunswick it, it really depends on on who's been giving them information on on what they should be buying now unfortunately a lot of these provincial retailers will look to ocs and and base a lot of the what's selling in Ontario and 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 say well maybe we should carry the same type of SKUs in in, in our provinces. Um, it it's not overly reflective of the fact that we have very different populations. I, I think in you know British Columbia where you have a, a more mature uh, cannabis sector, you probably can do a great job of selling premium bud that's at you know fifteen percent or lower in THC content uh, relative to to other places where. Um, you know, the, the 
both the bud tenders as well as as to to some degree the consumer and consumer are probably looking for something you know a, a much higher thc percentage because of lack of understanding of of really what this plant can offer so um it's, it's, it's interesting too because like a lot of these consumers most of them i would imagine consume alcohol and you know having a five percent beer it's not like a bad thing it's like you don't always want to do shots Right. having a glass of wine having a glass of beer is just fine so it's i find it fascinating that that somehow doesn't translate into cannabis for like uneducated consumers where they think oh higher is better and they can't see the parallel to alcohol that maybe maybe not <laughs> yeah. and I, I mean that's one of our drawbacks here in nova scotia is that all of our cannabis retailers are tied into the alcohol uh or into our liquor stores um which you know of course i do want to see that separation um although i'm a, a an avid whiskey consumer, um, <laughs> the the medicinal benefits of, of 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 alcohol are quite limited, and and really, you know, Except for Jaeger, Jaeger, yeah, you're, you're <laughs> that way, huh? <laughs> um, and if you if you're gonna use a Jaeger type thing for uh, for uh, for medicinal purposes, maybe, maybe not Jaeger itself, maybe something that's like a better bitter. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay, um, you know when you when you think of you know, the, the the fact that you know we've we've segregated um, you know we've we've thrown the cannabis stores in with the alcohol, um, it, 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 and it's a real disservice. You know, um, you you actually if, if you can walk into a liquor store uh, under age, but you can't walk into a cannabis store under age, and it, and it's it it's kind of also disappointing to see that the the con uh, constant comparisons. And, Mm -hmm. Or it's a little disappointing that way. Newfoundland and NPEI are, are similar to Nova Scotia. Um, um, Newfoundland arguably is still heavily influenced by by canopy, um, which you know can be good or bad. But uh, but I think it's time to to look at different models. Cool. Well, with with all this uh, kind of maybe uh, things that disappoint us being shared. Um, I'm curious if there's anything that you think is especially going well in the, in the legal craft cannabis industry in these first few years here. I, I think um, in, in some of your previous guests have mentioned, I mean, you know, these craft growers are producing fire, right? You know, it's it's amazing product. And, and I think it's it's rebuilding um, the, the name of, you know, ca Canadian bud, right? Uh, which, which after legalization and, and more corporate cannabis, uh, the quality of cannabis um, in, in Canada was so low that, um, that, that I, I think, you know, it was it no longer uh, had any, any positive in, in its reputation. Now with craft growers, of course, we are producing some amazing product um, and, and with varying THC potencies, um, which, is, which is really definitely showing that you can grow an amazing product um, that is equivalent to what you were growing in the legacy market and under under Health Canada's regulations, and that and that's an impressive piece for me because, yeah. like the the bio, especially the biological component, it's like, yeah. it's it's really hurts an organic farmer, and I'm and I'm, I definitely want to dive into that with you later because yeah. I think I feel like you've you'd have a very interesting opinion on that, but but that's that's what's impressive for me that they're growing fire with the restrictions that exist, some of which don't make any sense. Well, exactly. And, 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 you know, and, and being able to draw it down to that moisture content, you know, when, when we grow our bud at home, I'm sure it's, it's being dried and cured at probably closer to 20% moisture, uh, relative to the typical would be, you know, around 10% in, in this market, but we are seeing more in the craft that they can keep it to 12, 13% moisture, uh, still have their microbial or their water activity, um, sufficiently low that, um, you're still getting a nice, a nice bud and stuff. So. Um, yeah, very impressive. And I think those are, you know, real positives about the craft industry. And and I think what we're recognizing with some of the major players is that they they say, hey, we know what we're good at. And those major players are probably more good at sales and promotion, uh, more of that uh, administrative work. And let's let's leave the true cultivation to the those craft growers. And in some ways, like whether or not this would have naturally emerged, this kind of dynamic with the way the regulations are set up, it's been forced on people. Yeah. So if you're if you're a small grower, like you can't package your own stuff and sell it. You have to get a whole new license that's actually a real burden, costs way more money. Yeah. Like all of your expenses go up through the roof and all just to put 
flower inside a little package, which doesn't really make much sense to me. But uh, and so people are being forced essentially to sell to their competitors, and <laughs> and it's uh, it's kind of kind of kind of screwed. I I think it would have been great if naturally because of market dynamics and just the realities of hey, you know, once you're getting into consumer packaged goods, there's actually a, there's actually a whole bunch of other logistical costs to come up now you have to have a sales team you have to be able to market yourself to government distribution boards or mm -hmm. to medical patients if that's the direction you're going and and there that's a whole other skill set a whole other um set of requirements if as a result of those realities that have nothing to do with regulations this kind of model emerged that would be great because then it's like organic and not being forced on anybody so i'm so i'm kind of glad that there is a bit of that kind of organically starting to emerge that now in kind of these symbiotic relationships um but it, it, it does make me sad that like people are forced into it who might not necessarily want to do that yeah and it, I, I guess just even to follow up on 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 those concepts it is it is um you know, early on in legalization and, you know, you go to these conferences and it was really hard to get a, a head grower to a master grower to, to even be able to be permitted to speak. There was this whole idea that everything that came out of their mouth was, uh, was, uh, IP. Um, and <laughs> really <laughs> yeah, yeah. So now we're, we're, we're coming right back to the, the traditional subculture where there was, you know, there was a sharing of knowledge, right. And, and, and we're starting to learn more about cooperation, right? Just, oh, this just shows you how out of touch those companies are that they think that like yeah. a gardener can't talk to another gardener without like giving secrets away. <laughs> and, and the fact that they are secrets, right? Um, so, so that um, that that whole notion, you know, that, that I think that has speaks to the fact that this, you know, cor corporate cannabis is run more by lawyers than than uh, than growers, but. Um, yeah. It it is showing that yeah maybe maybe we will have uh, a, an emergence of more cooperative uh, marketing and sales and uh, you know right now I I work as a I, I shouldn't say work I I, <laughs> I, I volunteer <laughs> and I know why you say that statement <laughs> I volunteer as a QA um, for for so many micros um, uh, despite the fact that I I typically will tell most micros not to apply for a sales amendment or or go into processing unless they are are making uh, extracts or concentrates um in large part because yeah it's you know the q the qa position can be you know a hundred thousand dollar salary that that no micro really needs or wants to to um, have that burden on on their on their pay books right so yeah yeah especially in an industry where like sales aren't guaranteed right now mm -hmm. this the distribution channels are just so fucked that yeah. it's it's really not a guarantee and so why why risk that i think i think it makes sense to get that license and amendment if you feel like it's really right for you and what you know i want my own brand i want to make this happen and i feel like i can I, we have the capacity to do it on our own get there as you build up revenue like get your revenue going create a reputation for yourselves work with partners at first so that that risk is really reduced and then as you're in a better financial place, then then go to that next step. I, that's that's what I would do anyway if I was going to go down this path. And, and, yeah. uh, and, and, I, and I think that's definitely what we've done right in, in the craft. There are some phenomenal, and British Columbia has got some amazing craft growers uh, and micro growers uh, for the most, you know, many of them are micro growers who are being incredibly financially successful, right? Hitting, hitting some of those... Uh, dollar figures that I think people envisioned when they came into the green rush. Wow, you're you're actually having a million dollars worth of sales, in, you know, in a, in a year. That type of stuff is is incredible, and that's that's I think in, in many of those companies uh, or, or micros are still conducting business the way they used to in the legacy market. So it's still hiring a lot of local people, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Now out, out here, typically, um, you know, a lot of our more successful clients. Well, some of them will have incredibly deep pockets, and and for them, they're just kind of um, they're they're having a little higher burn rate than than most people could accept. Um, whereas the other ones have started small, uh, produce fire, make some good connections prior to to getting in uh, getting in, involved or marketing their product well enough that somebody is willing to pay them 
um, a fair price for for what they're doing. And and as as they know, they're good at their art. Uh, they can reduce their cost of production, uh, excluding labor, to close to maybe you know 55, 60 cents uh, per gram. Um, and then and then of course their labor costs, whatever they want to you know charge themselves. But can I've, I've, I'm I'm curious. Can you can you speak a bit to the history of cannabis in the Atlantic provinces. I don't, I don't know anything about like what it was like prior to legalization, what it's like been like since like, has there been a historic rich underground community? And, and I don't mean rich in the wealthy sense. I mean, like in the sense of like connected yeah. and caring and uh, yeah. It, it, it's uh yeah, it's, it's phenomenally, you know, and, and um, um, it's, it's quite interesting to, to, to note that, um, you know, we, we, we do always go to BC Bud and, and we, we always praise, uh, you know, the birthplace Kootenays as, as uh, Canadian, Canadian cannabis uh, birthplace type stuff. Whereas, you know, here in Atlantic Canada, it's, it's been rich and deep. We've had, you know, so many of the growers that, uh, that have joined into the legalized uh, framework. Um, many of them have been growing for 45, 50 years of their lives. Uh, we've got some pretty strains that have have um, done quite outdoor uh, cultivation. Are um, able to redress, uh, uh, you know, uh, address powdery mildew and botrytis. So we, you know, we typically will have a more humid uh, fall, um, and and so so we do want to try to finish our our harvest as as uh, as early as possible. Uh, you know, and so, and so, then I'm, I'm, I'm interpreting from what you're saying here. I'm inferring that these growers have historically been outdoor growers, and then yeah, in that for, for the most part, um, you know, definitely um, the legacy market would have had a lot, lot of the product coming from British Columbia uh, for sale. But our outdoor growers, a long history of of producing a lot, and and the resilience, um, you know, of course, um, I think recent recent studies have shown that Halifax uh, had the highest rates of cannabis in in the um in the wastewater system um really does show kind of that yeah we as in like just like joints being ashed or something or what what's, what's the source? That, you know it through our through our waste uh our bodily waste um they they check. oh <laughs> well, i mean we have a lot of we have a lot of got you in halifax but um but um i think i would speak to the fact that we we enjoy our um our medicine and um yeah so so whether it's you know unamagi cape breton island uh here on the mainland it is it is um yeah there's a long history of of, of growers who uh you know many of them have developed their own strains um and stuff so yeah cool man so what's 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 something in this industry that you think is especially bad and kind of stimming the ability for small scale producers to really thrive in the legal market? Uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's, it has something to do with more the, 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 the larger industry as a whole. Right. And uh, I am, I am definitely um, uh, one of those who want to continue to challenge health Canada to really start looking at uh, alternative models uh, this this whole idea of, of, of um, high THC and and if if anything uh, more if I was talking to another country that was thinking about legalization I would probably encourage trying to put a cap on on uh, THC on on flour you know or try to push it to you know maybe twenty five percent and say that anything above that would would not be eligible for flour. And, uh, but, you know, fine, you could take that and turn it into a concentrate or whatever. But and the, the reason I say that is that I feel like we have started to use the THC potency as a way of commodifying cannabis. And, and that, you know, something above 25% is worth $4 a gram and something below 25% is worth $2 a gram or less. And that's, and that's the challenge right now. Many of our micros are growing incredible product, but it's 24%. It's 22%. Um, Which is still enough to get you super fucked up. It's like, I would, I, I don't want to smoke that stuff. Like that. I, would, I, I can't, I can't. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of at 19% is where, where I go. With my, my I like, I like the single digits. 
I, I don't I don't use cannabis anymore because THC actually makes me really paranoid. I haven't used it in like maybe seven or eight. Years. I, I have like a yearly test, and every time I fail, I get paranoid again. But really? but wow. Uh, yeah, I, I used to, I used to use it quite a bit when I was younger. It was amazing medicine for me. And uh, um, but what I, I I I've actually discovered that I can smoke hemp flower, and that's like really oh, great for relaxing my body. The, yeah. Just the THC to CBD ratio has to be like one to like fifteen or higher, and mm. then I'm okay because okay. the CBD really counter yeah. counteracts a lot of the effects of THC. Yeah. Um, but back when I was using THC regularly, like I would like single digits, seven percent, eight percent, like that yeah. was great for me and just right. as long as there was a good other selection of terpenes and uh, cannabinoids in there and that was just it was it was always a beautiful high for me whenever i uh enjoyed enjoyed that that kind of medicine and and, and and i think the prices should reflect that right so so um if you produce an amazing you know planet of the grapes 15 percent something like that it definitely let's uh, let's uh give it the four dollars a gram and not uh penalize it to the point where you can't find a skew in many provinces that would allow you to sell a product that isn't um, above 19%, right? So, yeah. so I, I, I think it'd be very hard for anyone to walk into the Nova Scotia Liquor Commission and, and be able to find a, a, um, a flower that is under 19% because nobody's mm -hmm. offered excuse that low. So I think that's one of the biggest challenges. And because of that, you know, just exactly what you said in terms of what you, what you prefer to smoke, is something with a more robust cannabinoid profile. Um, when you get up to those high 27, 28, 31% THC, of course, you're not going to have as much CBD in there or CBG or, um, you know, CBN, CBN, all the other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And, and, and it's harder for a healthcare practitioner to be able to say that's, that's great medicine, right? Because, yeah. And it might be great medicine for somebody who, who has, uh, perhaps PTSD or or um, uh, somebody who's looking for um, you know high THC to recorrect them, um, but for most of us, we want to hit as many CB1 receptors and CB2 receptors. So it's kind of nice to be able to have something that that kind of will will uh, stimulate more more uh, receptors in your body. Mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. um so i i think that's the other challenge is, is that we we're, we're getting the problems where we're having um um labs even you know we we can't even trust a lab now i mean there's certain labs that you know yeah you're gonna you're gonna fire off uh your your test there because they will um i wouldn't say inflate uh your thc values but yeah, it's it's kind of funny. It's like Health Canada puts all these regulations and like restrictions on the production of cannabis, and then they don't have standardized testing for labs. Right? What the fuck? <laughs> like, how? Yeah. What? Yeah. How do you have a regulated market and not have like a regulated way to actually ensure that everything's being evaluated the same way? Like, it's it's so crazy yeah. to me. And, and then and then of course that leads back to you know now we probably are, are we getting close to like 800 900 um licensed producers or i, I don't know how many are it's any. it's a eight it's just over 800 yeah um and and that 851 i think is the exact number they uh, of course health canada doesn't have the resources to go out and do enough inspections and 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 repeat ins inspections and things like that so how how are we knowing that you know and, and not you know as 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 a qa pseudo qa um, QA on paper. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really trying to be very adamant with my clients that we don't cherry pick the samples. You know, you've got an SOP, you follow that SOP, you film the way you sample so that you can be able to show whoever you sell your product to. Here's, here's me sampling, right? So I'm not yeah. cherry picking. I am doing a, a good representative sample of, of my product. Mm -hmm. And really Health Canada has to go in there and make sure that, that in fact, that people aren't cherry picking and so that your your retained sample is reflective of the sample that you that you uh, submitted and stuff. So. And, and if you cherry pick, ultimately you're doing yourself a disservice because if you cherry pick stuff that you know is going to just be that much higher with all the various percentages and then you sell stuff that is largely not that cherry pick stuff then you're then you're kind of like you're just disappointing your customers if they're like oh this says 25 
but actually it's 19 because <laughs> there were only a few select buds that had that kind of higher percentage. And they're like, oh, well, I know what that feels like. And this doesn't feel like that. Why would, why would, uh, why would you want to have a dishonest relationship with your customers? It's yeah. not, not a great foundation for a good relationship. And, and, you know, many of our, uh, still, I, you know, one of the things I, I typically am promoting is that many of our micros, um, you know, cause I don't really feel like many of them have the, capacity to push towards a sales amendment. Um, you know, they are amazing cultivators and that's all they put their energy in. Um, they do it and they do it the best. Um, your relationship is with that person with the standard processing license and a sales amendment. You want to make sure that they see your integrity in, in everything that you do. And, and so of course, you know, sending in the right samples, arguably sending it to a particular lab, you know, one or, you know, a handful of labs, um, would would help as well. To to all of you in the chat, I just want to say like I really appreciate um, all the liveliness there. I've been reading all your comments, even though I'm not responding to them, and just appreciate you guys. It makes it so much more fun to kind of have people weighing in on their opinions on what we're talking about uh, as we go through it. And if any of you guys have questions for Av, go ask them in the dedicated uh, um, questions tab. And uh, what award are you talking about, Nathan? I don't know what you're talking about. But uh, we'll I'll let I'll let you ask that I'll let you answer that in the uh, <laughs> in the chat there. Which one? Anyway, back back to I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm sorry I'm <laughs> not gonna let you distract me, Nathan. I'm so curious what you're talking about. <laughs> um, uh, Av, is there anything else that you think is uh, really problematic in our industry that needs to be addressed? Pro probably comes down to promotion as well, right? Um, yeah. You know, I I am a I am a whiskey. Uh, um, I wouldn't say aficionado, but a, a, a liker of whiskey. And it, it is amazing that, um, you know, you can, you can watch commercials on television about consuming alcohol. Once again, no, no medicinal value other than your, your Jagermeister. Um, and, and yet we can't, we can't speak. We can't have anything around cannabis other than that. It, it's, um, you know, can can kill you, um, so which which it can't. So so it's it's really bizarre. So I think we we also have to try to do a better job of of, of trying to still continue to break that stigma around cannabis. Um, and, and it's especially and, bizarre because the a big part of why it was legalized was because of its medical properties. Like that was mm -hmm. kind of the push. It's like this is medicine. This helps people. This heals people. This fights cancer. This fights multiple sclerosis. This this solves autoimmune disorders. It stops seizures. It helps right. people who have tried all the pharmaceuticals, and they only made things worse. Yeah. And yeah. and yet, even though that was a big driving part of it becoming legalized, somehow Health Canada is just like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no to medical, and the provinces are like you can't talk about medical properties. <laughs> exactly, and and you know when it when it comes down to it, the the side effects. Um, are incredibly minimal compared to some of the, the side effects that we have with so many pharmaceuticals. And, and yet, um, so, so I think, you know, once again, through better promotion, breaking down that stigma, uh, I teach cannabis um, uh, cultivation at the Nova Scotia Community College. They, the students are not permitted. There's no safe spot on campus for, for students to consume cannabis. Um, uh, you know, that type of lack of, of opportunity for people to, you know, bring back that, 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 those, those aspects of the subculture where, you know, Puff Puff Pass was, was part of it, right? Not, not in COVID times, but, you know, um, but, you know, just the idea that you can walk in, in, into a, a smoking circle and, and be able to learn, you know, for me, I still, I still, when I, when I smoke a joint, it could be a strawberry cough. It could be a lemon haze. I don't necessarily taste it. Um, so I'm still learning, right? You know, my, yeah. my taste buds aren't there. I learn a lot from my students, actually, because they are, you know, far, far more adept uh, users. And, and they're, they're giving their sensory evaluation to a lot of the products. But that type of stigma where you cannot take your medicine um, on campus without, you know, breaking the law and the breaking the law would be, you know, smoking in your car or, you know, uh, going out off campus and, you know, smoking in the neighbor's parking lot, that type of stuff. 
Um, those are huge setbacks, I think, to the industry, which in fact will in, in turn affect, you know, micro cultivators, right? Hmm. So. One, one quick note on the flavor thing that I learned actually from Earl, who I think is uh, here in this chat here today, Earl Oliver. Um, Hi, Earl. Pre-rolls are a great way to not get that flavor because everything gets oxidized. All the terpenes get oxidized and you lose out on so much flavor. So it's, uh, and and yeah, I, I, I think if, if, if I'm remembering correctly here, Earl has a policy that if he makes a joint and he's smoking through and he doesn't finish it, he's not enjoying the rest of it later because it's just too oxidized to get to get any of that flavor out of it mm. so that kind of was a ding moment for me of like oh that makes total sense oxygen yeah. oxidizes things yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's interesting to think about this whole giant pre-roll industry and how like all of those pre-rolls are going to be relatively tasteless compared to actually like preparing a fresh um a, a fresh whatever it is that you're going to have whether it's a joint or a pipe or a bonga yeah. to enjoy yeah. And I guess that's why we'll, you know, they're, they're starting to, you know, have more terpene infused uh, pre-rolls um, where, where you're going to maybe uh, have the terpenes infused onto the paper and stuff. So, which, which is also, a, you know, kind of the, um, another positive aspect, um, which I think it evolves from the, from the subculture, the, the innovation within the subculture on how to consume this product, what better ways. And, and we're still, you know, learning so much more and hopefully we'll have even better better equipment, make it easier for certain people. People understand what a vaporizer does versus, versus, uh, you know, combustion and, and so mm -hmm. on and so forth with, with all these other, other tools. So I see a lot of positives that way. Um, yeah. So some, some of those challenges of, of trying to increase, increased awareness, consumer education, uh, allowing for social places for consumption, um, mm -hmm. just have to be, helping out more cool man um if if there was like one thing that you could change right now and i'm going to limit it to things that you haven't talked about so far because we spent some time talking about like the the thc limitations and kind of the 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 retail restrictions or distribution restrictions rather what what would you, what would you change if, you, if, if there's one thing that you think could like really really make a big difference for people you know, um, it wouldn't be uh, necessary for people, but as an industry as a whole, I think we need to start doing life cycle assessments around the way we produce our, our cannabis, right? Um, to, to me, maybe because I'm not a, a, a great cannabis connoisseur, although I am, I am part of the cannabis quality assurance, um, uh, we, I love my sun grown. I love my regenerative organic cannabis that I grow in my backyard, right? Mm -hmm. uh, of course, it's pretty rare um, uh, to, to see. If there's no, as far as I know, there's no sun-grown cannabis in, in Atlantic Canada on the shelves. Uh, I know that OCS does have uh, some SKUs dedicated to, to outdoor grow. I think we need to do that life cycle assessment. Uh, we, need, we need to be able to know how much energy we're using, what is our cradle-to-grave um, costs when it comes to producing cannabis, um, whether whether it's hydroponically, aquaponically, aeroponically, or living soils, um, these are things that we just don't have good numbers on, right? So, mm -hmm. so I, I really feel like that is, um, and and maybe this is where blockchain comes in. Maybe this is where you know, uh, probably some of these younger, hipper ways of. <laughs> marketing and communicating um information uh but that's the type of information i think i think we really need to address cool man cool no I, and yeah we haven't we haven't really touched much on the regenerative or organic uh aspects of cannabis or, or farming generally at all so maybe this is a you know we don't have any questions yet so i feel like we can just go right to eleven thirty without uh without taking questions uh you lost audience you you lost your chance to ask questions because now we're going to go on a 20 minute organic farming and uh and permaculture uh uh expedition here and and you know er earlier today i did mention i want to get into like a microbial talk with you at some point um but uh um I'm I'm curious if there's any if there's any takeaway for like a cannabis producer here today that's thinking about getting into regenerative farming that's getting into organic farming, what what would we what would you want them to take away from this conversation, 
or, or what do you think is like really salient advice for them to hear? I think that the biggest challenge with regenerative organic outdoor production is, is um, where's your market, right? If, if your market is just fresh frozen, um, you know, uh, being, being sold to, to some concentrate or extract producer, that's fine. Let's, let's just make sure you know what your cost, uh, what you're, you're going to get paid at the end of the day. Right. And, and if, if it's going to be 20 cents a gram, you can probably produce that for five cents a gram, right? You just have to know that if, if you're getting paid a dollar a gram, um, then you can probably do so much better and, and probably spend about 20 cents a gram and, and, uh, uh, produce a phenomenal product. So it's in, in my in my opinion, you know, when you're growing outdoors, it's it's one thing that we don't typically recommend anymore uh, because here in Atlanta, Canada, we're not getting those type of SKUs being offered to outdoor grow. So we we will typically say you're going to have to grow indoors um, to to be able to sell your product unless you, if you want to sell it as flower product as as flower. If you yeah. if you want to sell it, you know, as a micro. Um, you know, you you might produce two, 300 pounds, uh, in, in, in your 2152 square feet. Um, well, if, if that's, and, and you can get a dollar a gram, that's phenomenal, right? You know, cause you can probably produce that for 20 cents a gram, but if you're only going to get 20 cents a gram, you're going to have to try to pull that off at five cents a gram. And that's, that's, a, that's a lot of work for one person, or it's very little work because you can't afford to, to really you know, go out there and, and take care of those plants because you're only getting 20 cents a gram. So that would be my only caveat to outdoor production is really knowing what your price is. When it comes to a, a more of a regenerative organic approach, and it almost seems like an oxymoron when we talk about regenerative organic in a warehouse facility. I sorry, think, sorry to interrupt. What does oxymoron mean? Uh, just that it's a, almost like a contradiction in term where we're, you know, thinking that okay. something can actually be regenerative and yet be grown in a warehouse environment, right? Okay. Part of regener regenerative agriculture is, is that you are producing a higher quality product and being able to uh, main, main, not, not necessarily even maintain, but actually increase the, the soil um, uh, benefits, you know, and that, that, that soil provides. So I think if we're really looking at trying to make our organic living soil, organic systems more regenerative, we need to go to a bed system, right? We need to, um, sorry, we need, we need to produce, uh, our cannabis where we're not having repeated use of inputs, right? So we're not bringing in more cocoa, more peat uh, every time we we have a harvest, and we're starting, you know, push push those living soil systems. Um, and and I think I think I think more people are looking to that because, of course, we're trying to reduce our cost of production. Uh, this would not only reduce your cost of production in terms of reducing your input costs but i think in many ways it can reduce a lot of your your uh labor costs because some of the stuff that you just hate doing um is, is definitely washing right and if you're just washing containers and and uh you're washing pots all the time that's a lot of time and effort um quite similarly when you're just destroying a product if you, every time you have to be you know emptying out these pots and getting them shredded and so on and so forth it's very time consuming and costly so in, in an indoor living soil setup, would people be composting their prunings back into the soil? Because in an outdoor, like that's that's what you're doing. But in an indoor, I imagine that there's like a higher chance that because there's not like an outdoor breeze and wind coming through, that you'd have a bigger buildup of uh, of just different kinds of uh, microbial life that would really impact your ability to meet the uh, um, the regulatory restrictions that exist around that. Can, can you, can you speak to that at all? I'm, I'm um, just curious here. Yeah. So, so for the most part, um, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different pruning techniques. Um, you know, some people will, and, and plant spacing techniques, some people will have a very low plant density, maybe six to, you know, 12 plants per 16 square feet. Um, whereas others might put, you know, 25 plants or 16 plants in, in 16 square feet, you know, you know, either, you know, one to two, um, 
plants per square foot type thing. That that mentality. But then their pruning techniques, they they may some may strip off all the their leaves and and then that leaf material would normally just go back in, get destroyed, weighed and destroyed, perhaps go back into some composting. Um Outdoor cannabis, uh, we've we've uh, we've developed an, an SOP in which we just ferment our our prunings, uh, make a fermented tea, and put that back onto uh, onto the plants or onto the soil. Um, so those are different, you know, different options that people use, and they probably are making those decisions based on things like um, what type of humidity is being generated by by the amount of leaf material. And then, and and maybe what type of airflow I have in my facility. Mm-hmm. The most important thing to remember is that plants, much like humans, you know, you know, we we can stave off pests and pathogens by just being healthy, right? That's that's what that's what uh, a good living soil system can can provide to you, right? You you have all of the secondary metabolites that can ward off. If you got uh, a powdery mildew uh, spore that lands on on your leaf material, you've got the material that just you know makes that go away, right? It the plant can naturally produce those type of uh, defense, defense, yeah. defense mechanisms, right? And so um, it's the I think the only time we've had one of our clients who and and we typically are promoting living soil um, beds or living soil systems. Um, we had one client. Who who didn't who, they they failed their microbial test, and when it came down to it, they they realized that they had put their trim in their dry room, and and some of the trim was just you know a layer uh, of of botrytis, and, and of course those spores got everywhere. Um, so plants do have this innate ability if they are producing incredibly healthily that they can ward off uh, and and you know not have to succumb to uh, irradiation or other forms of remediation to get rid of microbial contaminants. And in an, in an outdoor context, if somebody's doing a full permaculture um, regenerative farming practice, so so just to give you some context, like I've I've been gardening for decades, um, and uh, and I work with plants all the time, but I've never like looked into like what's the microbial count like and th- things like that. I've never needed to. I've not, I've not been like licensed mm-hmm. in the cannabis industry in a way that like that is the thing that I have to do. In in an outdoor context, what my intuition and gut feeling tells me is that if you're outdoors, good luck passing those tests because you're literally in an environment where all these different natural, healthy microbial creatures are are interacting with with your plants and and that's not a bad thing but health canada has deemed it a bad thing and so therefore if you're licensed in this world you have to meet particular standards in the world of outdoor regenerative farming do you think it's feasible for somebody to grow really great cannabis and pass the microbial tests or is that like a real 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 challenge not a challenge at all i think i think most really? most growers if they're doing things uh, correctly, um, in a regenerative way, have, have got an incredibly healthy soil system, what we would consider a disease suppressive soil system. Um, there's no reason why they wouldn't. We have to remember that that may, you're, you're not getting tested on a lot of um, um, sort of, you know, powdery mildew is not going to make you fail a test, right? Because we know that it's ubiquitous. Powdery mildew is everywhere. It's going to land uh, on on the plants at all times. You're not going to fail a microbial. It's not going to taste great, so you don't necessarily want to have powdery mildew. But you shouldn't fail a test on that. You'll fail it on on other aerobic bacteria, molds, and yeasts, and so on. But a good healthy plant and the amount of sunlight and oxygen that's in those environments, most of those are, are can be warded off if you have an incredibly healthy plant. And a healthy plant means that you're photosynthesizing at peak performance, right? Well, we can't say peak because we're so far from reaching the genetic potential of most of these plants. But in terms of, of you know, having an incredible soil system where that plant can produce, uh, where it has access to in, incorporating endophytes, so bacteria that come, bacteria fungi that come into the plant um, that, you know, fight off all these other pathogens, 
uh, and or just being able to have all of the antioxidants and vitamins and minerals and amino acids and everything else that can produce an incredibly healthy immune system. No, no problem. And we've had several clients who, yeah, microbials were not their issue. Necessarily reaching that 25% THC, that became the, the challenge. Yeah. So, cool. Yeah. Uh, what, one, one thing, I'm, the last question I'll ask before I shift to the... Um, uh, to the questions because people did actually ask questions after I told them, fuck it, we're just going to talk about regenerative farming because you guys didn't ask anything. Um, the last question that I have for you before shifting to that, you know, you mentioned that powdery mildew is not going to affect your tests because it's ubiquitous. But my understanding of the Health Canada requirements is that they don't like check for like what type of um, microbial life something is. They're just they're just seeing an overall parts per million, parts per billion, whatever it is for all uh aerobic and anaerobic um uh life forms and can am i incorrect in that and if, I, if I think some of the methodology is not going to highlight um so so depending on the, the the proper assays that are being used uh will not be able that's why we can still use certain biopesticides right certain biopesticides are microbials right and we can still use those like actinovate is um and you'd think I'd know this, uh, uh, maybe it's a streptomyces. It could be a, a different, uh, but you know, we can still use certain biopesticides on, on the plants and they will still pass a test. Right. So, so we have, we have those, you know, we can't use, for some reason, we can't use uh, bacillus cumulus because that would, I think would show up as a failed test, which is, you know, it's unfortunate because it's an incredible, you know, beneficial pesticide. Yeah. Biopesticide. So, so the, you know, labs have to use the right ass assays to really look at what they're looking for. And it's often, um, you know, things like molds and yeasts, and, and then there are some bile tolerant negative bacteria, mainly looking at things like E. coli, uh, perhaps uh, Salmonella and Shigella. So. Yeah. And that's, that's where I would really like to see regulations shift to, Hey, we're not going to just like test all microbial life blanketly we're going to look at the things that are actually negative and harmful yeah. and if if you have high counts in those yeah that shouldn't go through if you got e coli and a significant number of it on your uh, plant i don't want that in my body yeah. but if you've got like a really beneficial bacteria that you know all your tomatoes or cucumbers or lettuce that are grown organically have on them like that's it's already in my body like why <laughs> why why limited in in, in cannabis yeah. Yeah, and, and, you know, I mean, I think we, we consume Botrytis, you know, on a regular basis, right? Uh, bud rot, you know, so the, 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 um, the species of, of mold in bud rot is no different than what you see when, you, when you're eating that strawberry and the one right next to it's got a little bit of fuzzy look to it. Yeah, you've got Botrytis on that, on that strawberry you just ate. So yeah. it's, it's less of an issue. I think, I think, you know, looking at alpha toxins and mycotoxins that are produced from Botrytis, yeah, it's, it's going to be pretty ugly looking bud that's going to produce those mycotoxins. So, so I think, yeah, uh, yeah definitely those regulations. I, I, I often will argue that most organic products, organic foods that you would eat would end up failing the test of that, of that cannabis has to go through including the pesticide test, right? Yeah. Awesome, dude. Well, thank you so much. Let's shift to see what the audience wants to uh, uh, to know. And um, I've, so, so we booked until 30 past. Do you have a hard stop then, or can we go a little past uh, that? I, I can ramble until, until, you know, people start asking me to stop. Yeah, until they start booing you, which isn't going to happen because we've had comments saying we, we can listen to this guy endlessly. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go in order of upvotes. Go upvote questions you like um, and ask uh, more if you got anything pressing you haven't asked yet. Uh, Nathan French asks, what are your thoughts on being able to trademark strains in Colombia? Hmm. Oh, it, very, very interesting. Uh, on uh, you know, my, my biggest challenge with this is, of course, uh, you know, looking back at the um, ancestors who who are our ancestors, you know, the the male and female farmers who, you know, cultivated this crop for perhaps twenty five thousand years, right? And where where is their acknowledgement happening, right? And 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 uh, um, I also think you know in the prohibition time, you know, all those breeders who who um, 
you know, we're growing this product and, and breeding and selecting, you know, where, where is their recognition? So, uh, you know, perhaps with things like NFTs and, and whatnot, you might be able to at least be able to have some type of ownership over, over this. But I would hope that in this, in this realm that we kind of look at uh, ways of, of um, preventing the corporate control of seed. Um, but at the same time, acknowledging some of that history of the current breeding and, 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 and celebrate some of that, um, as well. So I, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of against it. Uh, I, I still, you know, value, uh, names, you know, um, you know, there, there's, there's meaning. I mean, there's some, there's some names that are definitely misogynistic and, and, uh, and perhaps could be, you know, left out of, out of the, the scope, but, but there's, there's history in those names. I mean, I, I, I go back to, you know, like a deadhead OG and just to, to celebrate the deadheads, you know, and how much deadheads had contributed to strains, right. And in, in the fact that those, those parking lots were the best places to move seed. Right. And, and, you know, and of course there are probably hundreds of, of deadhead uh, dead related names, but, but, you know, I, I don't want to lose that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And, uh, trade, trademarking, patenting genetics is just such a, is like, it's a natural aspect of life. Like we're all made of genes and how, how are you going to say that this particular, like, how are you going to control that? What happens when the same exact like genetic marker shows up in a different strain? Are you going to say, Oh, that's mine. Cause it's part of my genetic. Like it's, it's such a, screwed up world and i hope we move away from this idea that corporations should have any kind of ownership over genetics that's that's really uh, right terrible I mean, and i i would hope that's where nathan's um question was more related to how do we stop corporate control over over seed um and and that's why i would i would really hope that we continue to have uh, have seed swaps and and be able to yeah to, uh, to keep that sharing culture now that I don't even think there's fish heads anymore. I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't know. I don't know where we're trading seeds. Taylor concerts. Yeah. Taylor Swift <laughs> arena parking lot. <laughs> uh, Nathan asks another question. Uh, he says your sweater says C Taiva, uh, but nothing online. Please explain. Uh, yes. Um, yeah. So this is um, um, up and coming uh, micro who um, they they haven't even received their license yet, um, but um, but they gave me some swag, so I'm uh, very happy uh, to be wearing uh, Sativa Farms. It's going to be based out of um, Yarmouth, Nova Scotia. The proprietors are Trevor and uh, Alyssa LeBlanc. Cool. Alyssa LeBlanc. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Earl Oliver asks. Do you recommend increased sampling slash testing rates for outdoor growers? Geese are common crop visitors out west and prob prob <laughs> the probability of bird poop without outdoors is much greater than the probability of bird poop with <laughs> without indoors. I'm uh, I think I'm interpreting that a little bit of logic correctly, but I'm, I'm not 100 percent sure. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I should hope so. Um, I, I hope we're not getting a lot of uh, um, bird shit in, indoors. But um, <laughs> well, I, I understand that. I, you know, I mean, when, when we look at, um, uh, you know, large scale flower production, I think the majority of that product definitely will go for concentrates and extracts. But what I'd like to see is that there is still some opportunity for those who are doing sun grown at a small scale where they can almost hand pick, um, uh, you know, some bud and, you know, hopefully do a foreign material, look at it, you know, do a, as much of an analysis of, of that, and then feel confident that they can sell that bud that may have had a cost of production of 15 cents a gram and be able to sell that uh, at a, at a appreciative market outdoors. Right. Because uh, honestly, I think the amount of electricity that we're using, um, I don't want to pick on just rock wool, but 
you know, the, the, the rock wool that's being put into our landfills, the amount of cocoa and peat, you know, like cocoa is not, you know, it's not overly sustainable when it's all coming from, you know, Indonesia uh, and India. Um, and, and definitely, you know, as, as much as we think peat is, uh, harvesting peat is sustainable, it's an ecosystem that we're destroying every time we harvest. So what is, what is peat? I'm actually not familiar. I, I've, I've, I've seen yeah. it in the context of soil right. type mediums, but what is, what is the actual source? It's a, it's, it's sphagnum peat moss. Um, so we have, um, in Canada is one of the richest places of, of these peat bogs. It's a, an elaborate ecosystem, just incredibly diverse ecosystem. Um, and, and it's, you know, peat will eventually over, millennia will turn into to um, brown coal and then in, eventually into coal right so it's um, it's it's a, it's a very distinct ecosystem that has all of these beneficial properties as a growing media and and uh, uh, there is we, we try to sustainably harvest we, we regulate how much we harvest every year but it's still we're destroying a uh, an ecosystem that's taken millennia to to be created. I had no idea. I'm glad that uh, you shared all that. Now I know a little bit more about uh, about realities of uh, of the gardening industry. Because because I don't think this is just a cannabis thing. I think this is it's, it's not a cannabis thing. Although cannabis has definitely put a strain on horticulture and, and agriculture because there is so much peat. There's certain peat companies um, who've said, "Okay, we're we're not accepting cannabis clients anymore. We're valuing." you know, tomato and cucumber and, and, and food production. And those have become our clients and we're saying no to previous clients who were cannabis. Right. So, so um, definitely a strain. And that's why we have to be looking at alternative sources for, for growing media. But Bill just asked a question that I'm going to have jump in right now. Cause it's relevant. Uh, what do you use to build your living soil mix? If not peat or cocoa, et cetera. Hmm. Well, and, and we do. Like, I would still recommend using some peat and some cocoa. Um, worm castings would come in there. Perlite, which is also, you know, harder and harder to get. Um, so you might mix it in with some lava rocks and you might use things like um, pumice stones and whatnot. There's a product uh, coming out of Alberta called Pure Life Carbon. It is a sort of a, like an activated biochar. Um, you know, th there's some you know, potential in that becoming a, a media. Um, within the horticultural industry, they've been looking at different uh, forms. Um, there's a company called Pit Moss, we, we recycled newspapers that they're bringing in. Wood fiber is actually coming in as well. Uh, so some people are using wood fiber, which is great because cannabis is a more fungal dominant plant. It, it kind of likes a better, you know, more you know, two to one ratio of fungi to bacteria type uh, systems. So these are all things that you would use in a living soil bed. And the benefit is, is that I'm not replenishing that peat every, you know, every eight weeks, right? It's going to stay there. And, you know, some growers um, um, have been, you know, using the same soil, same bed for five, six years, which would be like 30 crops, right? So it's, it's, you know, phenomenal savings that way. And of course you re-amend your soil every, every crop, but you're typically adding things like worm castings and, and other nutrients. And fertilizer tea. Yeah. Um, I forgot. I had a question that came out of what you said, but I forgot what it was. So I, not important. I, I also think like hemp herds might be, a you know, another That's... opportunity to, to become into, uh, that was a question I wanted to ask you. So yeah, you mentioned uh, uh, wood um, fiber going in. Would would like the stalks of cannabis or hemp plants could that be used as soil in some kind of way? If, you were if, to... if not, if not soil, it could work as a sort of like a biochar uh, wood fiber element. You know, adding aeration, adding you know, and if it's properly charged, it could be even a, a nutrient bank, um, which which I think and. I mean, yeah, I think we just have to become far more innovative. Um, right now, all those stocks, all those roots, you know, 95% of them are being, you know, put into compost or into the uh, municipal uh, bio uh, compost systems. So kind yeah. of, kind of uh, disappointing that we haven't sourced um, different ways of, of taking some of the byproducts of this industry and, and making them more beneficial and and when, when you say 
if it's properly charged. Oh yeah. What, what does that mean? Sorry, I, I, you know, um, oftentimes these materials can actually tie up nutrients, right? Because they can attract, they become a carbon source. And as a carbon source, they may attract a lot of bacteria and fungi. And then those bacteria and fungi are tying up a lot of those nutrients. So one way of doing that is you could take something like a biochar and, and um, soak biochar in a fish hydrolysate or in a kelp extract or in a humic acid. Uh, with with some other nutrients. Now all of the sites that can actually hold a nutrient are actually holding a nutrient. So now instead of sucking up nutrients, they can in fact give off nutrients and stuff. So, got it. Okay, thank you. I appreciate the explanation. Uh, Bill Logan also asks, both are not ideal, but irradiate or e beam. What's your preference and why? Um. I think I would go with the E-beam. Uh, so E-beam would be beta radiation uh, versus um, irradiation being gamma radiation. And, and it comes down to, in terms of gamma radiation, in, in my opinion, can lead to more oxygen-free radicals. Um, it's going to be a little bit more, um, in my, my, my opinion, it's going to damage the cells at a greater extent. So, so you may not, you know, um, you, you may you may not see necessarily a dramatic change in the in the terpene content in a short period of time, but over a longer period of time, because you've worn away the epithelial cells of your trichomes, those trichomes could be weakened down, and then and then now you're volatilizing or losing losing some of those terpenes. Uh, e beam is just uh, you know, it's a different wavelength and it's just a, perhaps a safer way, but I actually think we're, we're coming to some other technologies that, uh, you know, I, I want to throw out things like, uh, um, there is a pasteurization that is working. Some people actually freeze drying their cannabis, um, which, which does eliminate uh, microbial content. Um, there's cold plasma technology, which is something that, you know, organic farmers are allowed to use as well. These are all ways of remediating your, your uh, cannabis without having to go to irradiation, which can have significant damage to your cells, to the cells of the plant. And now you're you're kind of consuming something that's more dead. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if e-beaming, if that name was used to make people think that it's not irradiation. So that is it's a, different, it's a different thing. But when really it's the same thing, just different wavelength. Different wavelength. Um, yeah. yeah. I'm 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 sure there's uh, more um, you know the physicists in the group uh, would probably have better definitions uh, than than I gave, but that's that's my perspective. Perspective. All right, we got one last question here for for Bill Logan, and it's going to be an opportunity for you to shout out what you do. Uh, Av, uh, Bill Logan asks, are you doing any consulting work outside of Canada, and in what countries? And I will add to that question. Can you tell us about what you do in Canada that might be relevant to, to some people in the audience here, if you feel like sharing about that? Uh, well, th yeah, thanks. And thanks to Bill for the, for the question. Um, yeah, we, we did that whole licensing thing and uh, tried to make licensing very accessible. So that's kind of a little bit of the consulting aspect of it. Uh, you know, for the most part, we're quite interested. And I say we, it's, um, you know, Fleming and Singh is, is one of the consulting companies I work with. Um, what we often are trying to do is we love cultivation, right? I, I come out of 25, 30 years of working with organic farmers and organic agriculture. Um, that's that's what we love love to do. I, I design super soils. I predominantly work trying, trying to create, uh, you know, just add water super soils. Um, but really now really trying to push the living soil beds because of, of the economics around those, as well as the sustainability. And, um, and you know, for the most part, that's, yeah, that's kind of what we do. Um, in terms of consulting um, in other countries, yeah, definitely the US is picking up. Um, I think they'll run into a lot of the same, same mentality that we had here. Everyone wants to grow big. I keep telling them that, hey, let's look at Canada. It's much better to create a more sustainable business, which, you know, could be not, uh, you know, you're, you're more like family run type businesses. Um, and there's certain states that are doing really well with that. And then, of course, I think California is going to collapse and, and you know, we're going to see Florida, um, you know, really peak 
uh, those those are the type of tax issues and and problems that we're having in in the U.S. But there's always you know new new states coming on board every every uh, every, um, every month. Um, and then you know there's some consulting that works up uh, in uh, in in other countries, uh, UK, uh, Switzerland, Greece, uh, Malawi, uh, Zimbabwe, Colombia. Cool. And, and a lot, a lot of that, of course, because the U EU is is a, a really more focused around CBD, uh, or at least non-THC, um, uh, then then we're starting to look at you know those countries uh, as as potential export sources. My bias would be is that this is too good of a medicine to not provide for your own citizens. So the goal is uh, always to try to say how how can you make this more accessible, more affordable. And when you can actually grow something like CBD at around two to three cents per gram, um, you know why not? Why, why not make this more accessible to to uh, your own citizens? Cool, Ab. Thank you so much. And you have a you have a, a nice shout out there from Bill Logan. I'm going to read it out loud so that everybody watching this on YouTube can get hear this testimonial from Bill about uh, uh, about Av. Everybody I know who's big into living soil thinks the world of Av. Our LP project is on hold, but Fleming and Singh helped us uh, before we hit pause. Can't say enough good things about how helpful Av was. Such a generous dude. And I would have to agree. You've, you've been just a magical human being. And every time I've interacted with you, you've been just exuding loveliness. And uh, you carry yourself in a really grounded and, and caring, compassionate way. And uh, I, I appreciate you and who you are. And glad, glad to be able to host you here today. That, thank you. That's very kind. Very kind. Thank you. And right back at you on the uh, on, on the energy that you exude, um, and just if I can just comment on 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 Bill's Bill's comment, and and it, it's it is so important that right now I would probably spend more of my time convincing people not to enter into the industry, and and you know depending on the reasons why, um, you know Bill Bill's a perfect example of of somebody who's taken the time to do the due diligence to really understand. Is this the best time? Is this the best, you know, location? Is this the best approach, right? Because right now, if you've said, "Hey, I've got a hundred thousand dollars, I want to jump in and start, you know, growing cannabis and get a license," I'd say, "Well, you know, you tell me what you're expecting because right now, this industry unfortunately does require big bucks, and just because we can help you with the licensing at a relatively, you know, low cost, wow, this industry can eat you up and you know, Certicraft does make it so much easier. It's so much, it's, you know, and I don't, I don't just say this, you know, I say this to, to all our clients as well. Um, one of the, the best things about what Certicraft offers a micro client is you come into cannabis cultivation because you're really good at cultivating. The last thing you want to do is that compliance part, right? Record keeping, to me, record keeping is still important because that's your, that's your data. That's your data that you can make every grow better. But that, you know, filling out the Health Canada monthly reports and the CRA monthly reports, Certicraft makes that so easy and it's cost effective. And, and uh, yeah. Thanks, Av. Appreciate the shout out. Yeah. Well, yeah. But, uh, and, and, you know, you know, I say that to everyone. So um, uh, Certicraft is definitely for a lot of our clients because, you know, that's their passion is growing. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Av. We we we, uh, we can have this nice little ending where we compliment each other, and uh, that feels really nice. So, thank you for that. <laughs> uh, thanks for being guest uh, guest number twenty three here. Uh, next up is episode twenty four, and it's going to be our last episode of season one. Uh, we're going to have a season two. Don't you worry about that. It's not actually last forever. Um, next episode is going to be a panel with. Uh, uh, people with micro licenses who've chosen to have those mic those licenses revoked and kind of a discussion on why they've chosen to give up their licenses. Uh, we have only one guest confirmed at this point in time, uh, Samantha Klink from Funny Duck Farms, though she had to change the name to FDF Farms because Health Canada is not down with Funny Duck being <laughs> part of the name. Um, I'm talking to three other people who have revoked their licenses right now and just kind of trying to get a sense of who feels comfortable uh, kind of getting on that panel. Not, not everybody 
does feel comfortable with that. So we, we're not sure who the uh, the final two panelists will be, but uh, uh, this will be in three weeks. Uh, we're we're going to skip skip a week. Um, so it'll be April 8th, I believe, is, uh, uh, is the next uh, session. And uh, thank you uh, for being here again. Thank you, audience, for being here today. You guys have been great. I love all the interaction. You look like you're about to say something there, Av. So I was just going to thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. You're so welcome, Av. <laughs> and if you're watching this on youtube please hit the like and subscribe button and the little bell icon that i've now learned is important to bring up too um yeah and, and for those of you here in the audience who maybe have seen this for the first time uh we record all the previous episodes so if you like this uh you can check out all the previous episodes online uh if you go to content.certacraft.com and you click on state of craft at the top there you'll get like a really, really nice uh, interface that kind of shows a summary of what each talk is about. And you can, you can go, there's a lot to learn there. We got lots of like really, really awesome uh, people uh, uh, as guests. And I, I learned something new every single time. And I've been working in this industry in a professional capacity for, for, for quite a few years now. Um, and uh, thanks, Al. Thank you. <laughs> All right, bye, bye, everybody. I'm gonna hit the end but event thing, and if you if you miss the first part, as soon as I hit end, it'll re, it'll like restart replaying in a minute or two. So um, stick around if you missed the beginning and want to catch that now. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Av.